The evidence in this case will show that in the early morning of February 22nd of 2022, uh, the defendant strangled her friend Shad Theory into death using a dog collar. That after he was dead, engaged in sexual acts with him, with his body, subsequently dismembered him uh, using kitchen knives found in the home. Over the next few days, uh, in the first phase of trial, the state of Wisconsin, myself, uh, District Attorney Lassay, uh, will present a number of witnesses uh, who will testify uh, about what happened in this case, and that will show and demonstrate to you that the defendant committed these acts. You'll hear testimony and evidence will show that in the early morning of February 23rd, it was a Tuesday, uh, kind of a normal cold February in Wisconsin, uh, at a house on Stony Brook Lane. It's sort of, if you know the area, the west side of Green Bay, Fireman's Park, West Mason Street, that area. Uh, Tara Packnage is kind of in her home and is awoken by a, a storm door shut. There's a door that sort of abuts the, the uh, driveway to the residence, normal single-family home in the area. Here's a storm door closed and is awoken from sleep. It's early morning, 2.30, 3 a.m., somewhere in there. She goes and gets up. It kind of wakes her up, and she's aware at that point that her son, Shad, uh, was in the basement with a friend, Taylor. They had been over the day before, February 22nd, February 21st, in that time frame. And she kind of goes and sees what's going on, right? We hear this noise late in the night, early in the morning, and she sees the basement light is on. At that point, you know, she's aware that, you know, they were down there throughout the day of the 22nd, uh, and she goes down and, and sees, because the light's on in the basement, and she's seeing what's going on. And you'll see sort of the scene, sort of go down the stairs to a normal basement. It's partially finished on one half, partially like a utility area, laundry, that kind of storage area. And right next to the stairs, there's a five-gallon bucket that you get at a home center. And she lifts a towel that's covering the bucket. It's like a beach towel. And uh, unfortunately, uh, sees essentially a, a mother's worst nightmare, that her, her son's head is, is in the bucket. Understandably, you'll hear testimony about that and the, the shock that that uh, caused. Tara goes and uh, talks to her, her, her boyfriend who lives in the home, Steve, you'll hear from him. He goes and checks too, and ultimately they call 911, and that's how this case comes to be. You'll hear from the officers this morning, likely, uh, who arrived on scene and, and what they observed, obviously confirming the information that, that was reported to law enforcement about, uh, about Shad's circumstances, how they find the, the bucket and it has um, parts of Shad as well as knives. You'll hear about, at that point, a, a relative lack of other indicia of, of a crime occurred. It's not a significant amount of, of blood on the walls and on the floor. There's some. You'll hear about that. But it takes law enforcement time to, to see what actually happened, the full extent of what the defendant did in this case. By that point, they're actually interviewing the defendant, and she's providing them information that, no, Shad's still in the basement. The rest of him is still in the basement. And ultimately, you'll hear about what officers find in that basement. There's... As I mentioned, the, the living area has some mattresses, blood-soaked, once you remove the blankets, other clothing items. There's a tote, a teal tote, kind of a larger Tupperware that has uh, knives as well as um, body parts of shad. There's bags, a sort of duffel bag type item, a backpack, all of which contain parts of, parts of shad's body. <clears throat> as well as knives that were used in the dismemberment. And you'll hear all about that, the officers who responded on scene and processed the evidence, ultimately locating the parts of Shad. You'll hear about, then, other things that are found. Signs of methamphetamine use, 
which the defendant later acknowledges happened with her and Chad right before this uh, crime occurred. Cleaning products, as I mentioned, you may have an, an idea in your head of this crime and what that looks like and what law enforcement would encounter when they got there, and you'll see what actually encountered. You'll hear about Clorox wipes and how the defendant would go to the shower and sort of clean up and use a squeegee and clean up the scene. You'll hear about the uh, medical examiner and their team who, who arrive and are, are dealing with this situation. And it's determined that not all of, of Shadow is located in the basement. There's certain parts that are missing. And ultimately, in the van that the defendant is driving, gold minivan, there's additional uh, legs uh, of Shadow <coughs> found in that, in that van. You'll hear from Dr. Vincent Tranquita. He's our uh, medical examiner at the time. And he will testify about cause and manner of death. And you'll hear about the cause being strangulation. Significant force applied to the neck. Significant signs of strangulation that you'll hear about. And then ultimately, obviously, a significant amount of, of dismemberment after the fact. You'll hear uh, Dr. Tranquita talk about that. That's all happening at Stony Brook. 23rd, throughout that day, you'll hear about significant investigation that goes on at that house. And then you'll hear about then, a few hours after that, after that initial 911 call, how law enforcement kind of gets word that, you know, Shad was with the defendant, Mr. Business, before this offense, and that they locate her at her apartment on Eastman Avenue, sort of on the other side of Green Bay, east side encountered as she's leaving the apartment uh, that, she, uh, that she shares with another person. And you'll see that encounter, how the defendant is essentially literally caught red-handed, blood on her hands. There's a significant knife wound that she talks about later was suffered in the, the course of the uh, crimes. There's blood on her clothing. There's black sweatshirt, black sweatpants. And she talks with law enforcement for a pretty significant amount of time. Detective David Groff, who's uh, seated at council table here, uh, interviews the defendant along with an, uh, another detective, and, and they start to learn more about what happened in this case and sort of the hours leading up to the crimes. Again, it's a significant and lengthy interview, and the defendant's providing information that you'll see jives with what law enforcement's encountering in that basement. She admits to, as I mentioned, methamphetamine use before this. She and Shad were sort of hanging out beforehand. They were friends from school uh, back in the day, and it seems like they were in, in a friendly state at the time of, of this offense. And you'll hear then they go to the Stony Brook Lane home and go to the basement. They're let in by by Steve, you'll hear about that in the early morning of the 22nd. You'll hear the defendant describe that what apparently begins as a somewhat sexual encounter escalates to a dog collar being placed around Chad's neck. And the defendant quite vividly describes what she then did. She's yanking on the chain. She's describing what's happening to Shad. It, it's, it's evidence that you'll hear, and you'll hear it from the defendant's own mouth, that shows that this is an intentional act. It's not one pull of a gun trigger. It's, it's an intense act. You'll hear about that from Vincent uh, Tranquita, Dr. Tranquita as well. She's pulling harder, harder, just hoping that, that he eventually passes. And it takes a significant amount of time. It takes several minutes, as you'll hear her say. After that, after Shad's deceased, she describes what she then does uh, with his body, again, engaging in sexual acts, ultimately dismembering him quite significantly. She reports that afterwards, that law enforcement would have, have fun finding all the body parts that are, are located throughout the basement, told law enforcement where to find certain body parts, like I said, it wasn't obvious to law enforcement who initially respond to that basement what happened. It's information being provided by the defendant that later is corroborated by law enforcement. 
You'll hear the defendant admit to cleaning up, avoiding guilt, avoiding responsibility for this. You'll hear her talk about that. You'll see the, the signs of that, as I mentioned earlier. That dismemberment process takes that entire day of the 22nd, essentially. As I mentioned, Tara wakes up to, to Taylor leaving at about 2.33 a.m. on the 23rd. The investigation doesn't stop there, despite the defendant's uh, confessions. Law enforcement continues. They send DNA to the lab, and it confirms the accounts that we're getting here. Blood on the defendant's hands, left and right hands, or, or shads. Blood on the knives, some of the knives that are used is, is shads. Uh, the clothing item, as I mentioned, the black sweatshirt, black sweatpants, has red substances, blood on the sweatpants, all consistent with what happened, with the defendant's statements, with what law enforcement's seeing. So this case is really not a, a whodunit. You'll, you'll hear about the crimes that clearly occurred. You'll hear the defendant's statement saying, yep, I did it. And you have DNA evidence and other investigative tools that kind of corroborate everything else. So for this, the defendant's charged with the three crimes that, that the judge read off earlier. First degree intentional homicide, mutilating a corpse, dismembering the corpse, uh, and then third degree sexual assault. So we'll get into what that all means later. Uh, we'll have closing arguments where we kind of summation, uh, provide summation and provide all that to you. But for now, as you kind of listen to the evidence, count one, the state needs to prove that the defendant caused the death of Shad and that she did so intentionally. As I mentioned, you're going to hear a lot about that. And it, it's nothing but intentional. This is not an accident. This is not a mistake. It's a significant act the defendant did. Dismembering a corpse for the purpose of concealing a crime, you'll hear a lot about that. And third degree sexual assault, how she engaged in oral contact with, uh, with Shat's body and inserted objects in his body as well after the fact. I, I know in voir dire, some of you talked about, you've, you've heard some uh, about this case. And um, that's to be expected, potentially. It, it's really important to stress that our system of justice is not based on, on media accounts, on word of mouth, on what you hear. The evidence is what happens in, in these four walls, and what you hear and see. And ultimately, the evidence in this case will point to one area. The defendant is, is guilty of these three crimes. So again, this is just meant to be an overview on the evidence we expect you to hear over the next few days in the first phase. But ultimately, the case comes down to choices and, and responsibility. The defendant made a series of choices, February 21st, 22nd, and 23rd. Choices to use methamphetamine. Choices to kill her friend, Shad. Choices to then utterly degrade him after the fact. The choices the defendant made. And when we come back in closing arguments later this week at some point, we'll argue to you that the, the evidence in this case is clear. The choices the, the defendant made uh, indicate that you're not going to have a reasonable doubt about what the defendant did, that she's guilty of all three crimes. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen.